This is the Indian Nest podcast, stories of success from leaders and change makers of Indian origin. Why have Indians achieved success across so many different disciplines around the globe? I have no idea, but let's find out together because every story is unique. And I'm very excited to have Prem Natarajan with us today. He's the chief scientist, EVP, and head of enterprise data and AI for Capital One, a leading financial services company. He has also been in leadership roles for USC, University of Southern California, and Amazon. He's also a fellow of IEEE. I invited him on this show as I was fascinated by his journey from India to Amazon, to USC, to Capital One. Welcome, Prem. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on our podcast. Delighted to be here, uh, Sanjay. Thank you for hosting me. Uh, Prem, uh, uh, our show is the Indian Nest podcast. It's basically about chronicling journeys of uh, change makers and leaders like you to inspire others who are looking at uh, their own journeys. And to chronicle that, we have to really go back right from the beginning. So please take us to the beginning of your journey, maybe even before that journey. Take us where were you born? Tell us about your parents, grandparents, you know, and then we'll dig more into it. Yeah, no, you know, looking back from 2023, Sanjay, some of the uh, history that I remember from my early days is so kind of, you know, quote unquote, idyllic for lack of a better word. I was born in Chennai, uh, Madras at the time. Chennai always in Tamil, Madras in the Varnai. And I, my mom was, you know, from Chennai, or is from, originally from Chennai. And uh, back then, as you know, the Pratha was that women usually went to the mom's place, you know, whether you call it any hall or Mahir, you know, in for childbirth, you know, kind of, you know, in today's world, quaint little practice where the belief is that you got the best care at your mom's place. And so, so, so while my parents were in Pune, because my dad was actually born and brought up in Pune, because his dad had moved to Pune to work in, you know, like many folks of Tamil extraction who were outside of Tamil Nadu. My, uh, both my, actually the grandparents, both of my grandfathers worked for the Indian government in some sense, right? And so my paternal grandfather had already moved to Pune. And so my dad was born and brought up in Pune, but my mom had gone back to Chennai for childbirth. So I was born in Chennai. Chennai. Kind because of, she went back to her, like you said, Nani Hall for yeah. the birth. Yes, indeed. That was the reason. And right. so, and... Same happened with my brother. I have a sibling, Sean. He lives in Plano. I live, as you know, in Los Angeles. And Sham was also born in Chennai for the same reason. Sham is younger to you or older than me? Younger to me. And so he's also, he was also born in Chennai for the same reason. Case, because my, because of some of the peculiarities of my dad's job at the time, I also ended up going back to Chennai for my first grade. So... I studied at this school called St. John's in my course, which was it's still in a very formative stage. And so I remember like my first grade education was a thatched roof thing. You know, it's Chennai, you expect big metro, big city. So even back in those times, you expect, and most of the schools were pakka buildings, you know, but this particular school was going through an expansion. So I remember our first grade class was in that kind of brick walls, but a thatched roof. Because they were expanding and, and for the strangest of reasons, I remember our uh, first grade English teacher's name, Rose, because she would constantly challenge me on my ability to recollect poetry, which in a way actually put me onto poetry for the longest time, but I actually, she did not drive me away. It was like actually the other, but, so first standard in Chennai, but then came to Pune, came back to Pune. Did. In the second grade, right? Second grade. Okay. Uh, because dad yeah. was posted in Pune. Yeah, dad was, after that, we were essentially in Pune. Okay. For the rest of my, like, kind of family life. Right? Okay. So tell us, you went back on the second grade to Pune with, with mom. 
And what school were you in Pune there? So there is a school. So I'm sorry, I know a lot about Pune, but anyway, that's a whole different story. No, okay, it's interesting you should ask. I was wondering whether to get into that, but it's its own interesting story too. The name of the school is Saraswati Vidyana Union. But there are actually, I later found out, two Saraswati Vidyana. One that is in the heart of the city, which is a Marathi Indian school. And this one, which was S, you know, more formally known as SV Union, except for the people who went there, we called it Saraswati Vidyana. And it had started, the school, you know, we lived in a place called Rastapik in Pune, very close to camp, not very away from station and all that. And Rastapet had a large Tamil community, very large Tamil community, supposedly back in the 50s and 40s and all. And so as with any kind of, you know, back in the day, you can imagine it's almost like a emigrant community, right? Coming from Tamil Nadu to Maharashtra. So they, you need to build all the social structures today that I see. So there is a parallel, which is why I find this interesting. So my maternal grandfather was very involved during the time that he was also in Pune for a while. Like the you know participated in setting up a temple. There's one there called Bhajana Mandapal, which is basically Bhajan Mandap, right? But it was a Danpati Mandir, Shiva Mandir, everything in there. And concerts happened, all the traditional Tamil concerts around the December month of Margaret and all of that. And you know, my mom is a very good singer, so is my wife. And I I dabble in poetry. So so the, so anyway, my mom used to perform at those concerts, etc. So very fond memories of that temple. And, but that small community also created its own school called SV Union. So the women in the community created the SV Union school, which was first a primary school, became a middle school, became a high school. Today, it's an undergraduate degree offering college as well, right? The school that I, in Pune, in last Africa. Actually, it's in Somar Bay. It's right at the right at the cusp of Sarasta Bay and Somar Bay. Near, I don't know if you know this place, Sanjay, in the King Edward Memorial, KEM. Yeah, Hospital. I know. I'm sure you know Dagru Maharaj and all those oh, other yeah. places. Oh, yeah. Yeah, So, German bakery and all. Anyway, I could Oh, German the, bakery, you know, and well, yeah. it's famous for other reasons too. Yes, yes, of course. The But anyway, today when I look at our life here in Los Angeles, before that in uh, in, in Massachusetts, but more so in Los Angeles, because I think we kind of became more established in terms of where we are in our life, things like that. We are very engaged in the local uh, community, the local Indian community, but also the local South Indian community, very involved in the local temple. We are trying to help among many people. It's not like, but we're trying to help, you know, there's a temple which is very popular. It's called the Sri Panchavakana Temple. And then, so... The whole community goes there in this local South Bay area and uh, trying to see how we can find a more permanent place for it, etc. So in many ways, I kind of think of it as like this cycle, but it, it, it re reappearing in many lives. And, and because of my history in Pune, I also have a lot of friends who are essentially, I consider myself like Maharashtrian, like, you know, like, like you call here, Indian American, I think, Tamil Maharashtrian in that way. Right. And so, and to show you my roots, you know, one of my friends actually just uh, a few days ago sent me this book by Pula Deshpande, who was a celebrated Marathi author called Marathi Kar. And I was just <laughs> remembering the stories, but as I just started yesterday evening reading this, it's, that's why it's at my table. I was reading uh, the first uh, story. Uh, in there and remembering. Anything. I have a story for you on that book. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, we interviewed his grandson, which will be coming out in a couple of weeks. Oh, wonderful. So I will, uh, but anyway, I'll take that aside because I think our guests might, we might be getting more into Pune's history because as I said, I know a lot about Pune. But uh, Prem, coming back to it, you migrated, well, I wouldn't say the word migrated. You went to from Chennai to uh, Pune you know, so to speak, as there was a large Tamilian community there. And were you mainly hanging around with that community? How was the school? You went from, this was a school set up by mainly Tam Tamilian people, their, the wives, etc. So talk about, you know, your school, talk about just a little bit about your early school years. I want to see what were the influences that were happening there. Fascinating. So the thing is, 
the school had been set up by these folks probably two or three decades before uh, I do it, right? So, for example, my uh, dad and my uncles studied in that school. So to give you a sense of how times change, and this is a story I think most immigrant communities anywhere in the world would relate to. So I get into fourth grade at the and fourth grade, you get to choose an extra language. And they, it was the only school in Pune that offered Tamil language to study at the time because of its heritage. But as an indication of the times, it was just me and one other person who wanted to study Tamil because the rest of the class was largely non-Tamil by the time. So that year, they formally scrapped the Tamil course. Well, uh, whatever Tamil I learned and the, uh, my kind of, you know, I'm not super fluent in reading and writing yet. I'm fluent in speaking it, but I can read, um, is, is because of uh, a little bit of homeschooling by relatives here and there, right? And so, so that gives you a sense of how it changed, right? Uh, yeah. So I learned three languages at school, right? English, Hindi, Marathi, you know, the standard language formula in yeah. India. And so. I think in any case, Tamil would have been a fourth language. You know, some people, you can choose Sanskrit if your school offers it, but and so, but I spent, yeah, studied those three, but most of my, in fact, I would say all of the friends that I interacted with on a daily basis were not Tamil. No, they were either Maharashtrian or Sindhi or from the Rajasthani community, because by then even Rasta pay had evolved. The first, just like any American community, right? Like the first people come in, they settle down, they create this infrastructure. Then their children grow up, they find other things to do, they move out to other parts, right? Of uh, whether it's of Maharashtra or other parts of India. And in fact, one of our uh, great family friends, you know, my grandmother's family, you know, at that level, I remember how, you know, this dude was like maybe 15, 20 years older to me and was moving to Switzerland. And at that point to me, we were like, Switzerland, I said, I don't know, it kind of was amazing. And, and he was, and I still remember like, you know, I must have been sixth grade maybe. And he, clearly he had graduated and he was moving on and he came and gave me a small, uh, travel chess set as a parting gift. And so for the longest time I cherished that on all of our train journeys. Uh, I used to take it with me and tell them, you know, this guy was like so much older than me. You know, he, you know, we got along well. He is like, you know, the strange things one cherishes in life. But yeah. So why did you cherish that? I'm just curious. What was so, what was the significance of that? To me, it was somebody who came from this almost exactly the same uh, context that I was socially, uh, like achieving something at that time to me was probably at the edge of my imagination. Remember, this is before movies really filmed song sequences in Switzerland. Like, you know, like, you know, Switzerland was not yet brought to the masses. You have to worry your charge films privately. Uh, and so, so for me, uh, it was just like, this person was on a magical journey. And so that chess piece was my connect with that the chess set was my chess what so do you think that had something it played something in your subconscious or something frame yeah that two or three that chess set that person switzerland that whole land that you don't know about yes i think there were two or three uh things. so for some reason my grandmother super fascinated by the apollo launch to the moon this was before i was born of course but she used to always talk about how they were all sitting around the radio listening to the man going to these people going to the moon. And she used to talk about it at a young enough age where uh, I was like, I couldn't tell if this is a story she's telling me. <laughs> and did you really go to the moon? Because on the other hand, I was still listening to stories about Chanda Mama and how like it's a celestial, you know, divine body. And, you know, so all of these various conflicting concepts were clashing around in my, he's still very formative. Vain. But, and so, but then once I found out, like, who put it there? And she said, oh, you know, America. I said, what's America? 
And then we said this thing. And then I remember like one conversation where my mom said, you know, when the Russians were the first to go to space, I said, Russia, like, well, this is like, what is this thing? Like, you know, I know Bombay, Pune, Chennai. <laughs> That's know, it. Russia. That was your world. That was your world. That was my world because I had mamas and uncles in Delhi and Bangalore, this and that. And Calcutta was like edge of the world in a way. And so... Oh, in fact, I remember one of our relatives got posted to, what was it? Siliguri or something. And then some, and then after that to Guwahati. And they had to fly to Guwahati. And that was the first time I heard of like somebody taking a flight. And I thought like such a weird luxury to fly inside your own country until I found out that there really wasn't any other way to get there. Kind of, almost, right? Otherwise it would be like a multi-day even though two-day journeys were not uncommon in India, but multi-day journeys were still too much. So, and so, so it was kind of this interesting thing because our own family was expanding. And but the other thing that put this in my mind, I'll tell you, which is a very strange thing, I still remember so clearly. No single thing usually drives us. Right, it's a multiplicity of factors, and the thing that role models play in our life is that they make things seem feasible. So when Raju, this guy who went to Switzerland. To Switzerland. Yeah, he did it. That made me think, somebody like me. Can do it. Uh, one second. Wow. Not explicitly, but I'm sure when I think back. Back. That was what I was latching on to. But my grandmother used to tell me, you know, she, her biggest thing was, because my, one of my uncles got into the civil services. That was yet another eye-opening thing for our community. Like, oh my God, uh, opinion from Rastafi is easy. And so grandmother wanted me to get into the IFS. Was a, she would have been delighted. But I was not like, you know, kind of found it vaguely interesting, inspiring, but just as my life unfolded, it was clearly not something I was something. Were you close to your grandmother? She you, she comes up quite a bit and she seems like a very forward thinking uh, lady. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, most people of the... So, first, I think my paternal grandmother's influence on our family cannot be overstated. But like all strong personalities, there's so many sides to Of course, other. of course. So, but for me as a kid, I always found her kind of larger than life in, in a sense. Like, you know, she had all these friends, she was moving around in the community, she spoke her mind, you know, which, you know, for that day and age... You know, she was her own independent personality at home, even when my grandfather was. And so these are not things you like very really consciously synthesize, as you know. But subconsciously, Prem, those are the things that kind of play. She talked to you about the Apollo. She talked to you about us. Uh, because these things, realize at least uh, I see myself as that they have a play. But so Raju played a subconscious role. But enduring. like it's Enduring like, role. And when I say Raju, that concept played an uh, important role is what I'm saying in terms of opening your eyes and mind. So now, how was school? Was it difficult, easy for you? Prem, talk a little bit about your academic issues. School was not difficult for me in the sense that, you know, just to expand it a little bit, you know, Two people played a role in shaping my ambition. Almost everybody in your family does, right? To something. But one was my grandmother, who had very specific ambition. And the other was, without question, my mother, who was constantly pushing me to do better. And so, so on a day-to-day -day basis, I think my mom's push was, was quite crucial in uh, shape. School was not challenging. Partly because I, I don't think I had like grand ambitions in school. I did not. I did well, but knowingly because I knew my mom expected me to do well and I was like, and I didn't want to let her down. But I didn't, I wasn't like intrinsically, like what, when I look back, these are all the, the reflections of a much older man on a much younger version of himself. So who knows exactly what was going through my mind at that time. But when I look back, I think it was a lot of my, this is where I kind of formed one of my, I, I don't think this is original to me, but I think 
you know, there's this general theory one can subscribe to that humans form around expectations. And once I came to the US and I was reflecting on my early life, you know, maybe, you know, I don't know, once I was on 30 or something, I started becoming more and more kind of grounded in the notion that humans form around expectations, right? And, and ambitions are simply a crisp formulation of our own expectations. So ambition is your own expectation for yourself. But I think equally if not more important, especially if you care about others, is what are their expectations of you? And in trying to to those expectations, you can sometimes surprise yourself or like, you know, exceed your own ambitions. And so in many ways, I'd say that has been kind of a continuing theme of good fortune in my own life that at every moment, I, I don't think you want to have a single, I mean, one thing I, say, I don't think you ever want to have a single role model because they exhaust possibilities. But I think every aspect of yourself, you want different role models. And when I think of it that way, I tell you, my, my daughters, we are blessed with three girls, right? Lata, one of you. Each of them in the last several years has become a role model for me in their own particular way. I can look at them and, you know, whether it's the notion of kindness and compassion and thinking about the other person versus I say, you know, I wonder whether I was consistently like this with them. Like, you know, they exhibit this thing about, you know, so I think what I mean is like each one can be, so I've been like, that has been the same of, I've been able to find the right collection of role models at every yeah. thing. But coming back to mom, was she helping you with homework? Occasionally. Occasionally. But she had uh, subtle expectations of you and you did not want to let her down, right? Oh. Well, that no was in the back of your mind. I don't was subtle, Sanjay. It was not subtle. <laughs> they were very explicit. They, okay. were not, they were gentle, I would say. They were not you shall do. So I grew up for that age and thing with no corporal dis experience at all at home. Like I know, I know I talk with a lot of my friends, etc. It just seems exceptional. But I think that's because my dad had experienced that and he was completely opposed to it because he, I think as a child, he, his, his own relation. So I think my dad is different that. times. Those were different times, different so. times. And he's very gentle. Right. So I think his own approach to that was shaped by the fact he chill out, gusa dekhao, but never, never. never. But then Prem, uh, what was dad's involvement in homework or anything else that you were doing? Or is it just mom was there? Or was dad busy with his career all the time? Dad was, uh, I'd say, busy with his career in the sense, you know, those days jobs are demanding, right? You know, give the state of infrastructure or commute. If he would have to leave home around 7.30 and, you know, he'd come home around 6.37. Like, like, but a lot of the front end, the back end was travel, right? And, but the, I'd say that my dad was also involved. Like he had, he was the only one who put like maybe everyday rigor into my, so my grandmother said these strategic ambitions and my mom had tactical ambitions and all or tactical expectations. I mean, dad was like the operational rigor, if you will. So I remember he decided that my writing wasn't high quality enough, right? quality of my handwriting. Cursive handwriting. Cursive handwriting. Cursive handwriting. <laughs> yes. So, so he so I had to so for for the longest time for many years, I wrote a page of English cursive writing and you know Hindi or Marathi cursive writing. But but he didn't say what I had to write. He would just say, I want you to write a page of something like cop copy, write original, it doesn't matter. And so uh, I think that brought some much needed focus on the basics, which I think is a good thing for a kid to have. And, and it was very interesting that I did it, even though there was no real corporal, it would literally again, just be, he'd say, oh, like, oh, again, you've not done. And like, oh my God, he's going to say that again. So that can go do it. Right. So. So that is good. So you had three different influences. Now, 
Did you build friends there in school, early part of school? Yeah. You talk about, were there any friends that were really close at that time? Uh, unfortunately, one of them uh, passed away a few years ago, even though very young age, but he was probably my uh, best friend from uh, elementary school. Uh, was uh, uh, Rakesh Agarwal. Hmm. Very sorry. He was based in Pune? Based in Pune. Very successful businessman. Maybe a quick digression into him. He academically very capable. Never killed himself to do anything, but was always in the top five in class, right? Of those ones who just get it like this, man. Get it like that. And then in ninth standard, he said, one day he came to my home and said, I said, Rakesh, what are you? I mean, it was it like, imagine this, right? It's like, we have no Bill Gates in our minds at that time. Keys. I'm like, Akish, what happened? Like, he came from a wealthy family. You know, we middle class. But he, his dad, his dad was a businessman. You know, they had color TV, right? That kind oh, of that's thing. like the 1% at that time. 1% at that time. <laughs> and so I said, Akish, what, what, what's going on? And he told me, my, friend, my dad wants to sell, sell our shop and open a much bigger shop. I think this is going to do very well. And I'm telling you, I had no idea of entrepreneurship or any of this thing. I was quite convinced it was absolute madness because in my mind, the pattern was fixed. You study, you go to undergraduate, you do graduate work, then you go work. Just go. And, then, and then he said, he told me, this is going to be. But now when I relate back to it, I think he was the first entrepreneur I met in my life. So he was doing the Thiel Academy or whatever you call that now. <laughs> yeah, no, first one to do it before yeah, Thiel. Before Thiel came, Peter yeah. Thiel came in. Wow. So he left school. Did he actually leave? He did. He left school. But you stayed in touch with him, right? And then we even moved out from our last bit locality out to Nigri for my last years of schooling. I would still, you know, we would often travel to meet each other. I stayed in touch with him. It was a great break, you know. So you had good friends that you built there. Any sports at all, Prem, while you were? The gully sports, right? Like, so the sports that dominated my childhood were cricket, gilly danda, and marbles. And then and the two games I remember from marbles from my childhood were Akutaku and Rajarani. Right? Wow. Wow. No, that is fantastic. Now, Tell me, you know, I ask a lot of our guests and they talk about the role of sports. Now you look back and obviously gully sports is very different. That Do you think sports has anything? I mean, a lot of them talk about how it teaches them humility because there are other people who are better than them. It teaches you teamwork, especially if you are in you know, something like cricket or something. I mean, when you look back now, obviously... Gully sports is very different. Any thoughts on sports? Yeah, I, so one thing I've seen in my life, I'll, I'll say two things. How it influenced me and how it influenced, how I've seen it influence others. I think people who play sports, think, starting with the second one first, people who, who play sports competitively at a competitive level, I think it's a phenomenal shaping influence in their lives. I mean, I think they're able to go through serious moments of challenge and hold on to the belief that they can prevail. There is something deep in them that they can pull up when they need it. For me, actually, the sports, because you know, when I say gully sports, it was also you played one neighborhood against the other, and then we had a kind of weird uh, league. Uh, it was, I also learned how to navigate, in some sense, gully politics, you know. Because I was very involved in, in all of these games. And I remember how, for example, I also decided what I would and wouldn't do. So it taught me certain guardrails for myself. Like one time I was asked to be the scorer uh, for the team when our team is batting and then you know, somebody else does it for the other team. Like, you know, one of the members of the team themselves is, it was very strange, right? You, if you put 11 people together, you're lucky. So you have to be um, somebody's umpire, somebody like everything. So, and I realized that there was an implicit expectation that you would every now and then add an extra run to your team. And I, it, it wasn't like anybody told me it's all, I just, and so we had a big to-do like that evening. We all came back 
and you know the equivalent of the dressing room conversation with me. Wait, if you perform like this, we're never going to win. Like win. you have to. <laughs> like, you got to fix it, Prem. <laughs> you got to fix it. So, so I, we all fundamentally we were all friends, and then I just said, "Yeah, ne yoga mere se." So, so then they said. So then I remember the captain said, "Hey, Prem, look at the scoring rates in Atta. Like, give it to someone else who will add the extra run, right?" So, <laughs> so those kinds of. So I think you learn things about yourselves in sports because it puts you in kind of a different social context than almost anything else. That's a great point. It puts you in a social context uh, better than now. So Prem, as uh, school years were going on, you were going, you got into high school. Now was it the same uh, school uh, that you were doing high school? Tell a little bit about high. No. So remember, like back then, you had there were some schools that also eleventh and twelfth. But most places in Maharashtra, it's called junior college. So I went to a junior college in the city. Which college was that? Karve Road, yeah, called Abba Sahib Garwari Junior College, and it's on Karve Road. And because you know, from up until I finished eighth grade in Rastapuri, then ninth and tenth grade, my parents had bought a plot of land and built our own house in Nigri. It was a new development. It was one of the original suburbs of Pune, the creation of suburbanism in India. And there was a fantastic school run by a missionary run school called Saint Ursula's in Chinchwood. That was an eye-opening experience for me. They actually had sports facilities, and we each had our own micro. Can you believe it? The lab because oh, Switzerland connection. It was supported by a Swiss <laughs> convent. You know, I am. And I go to the lab, the biology lab, uh, for my first biology lab at that school. And I saw like an array of microscopes, and everybody else acted like they all deserved a microscope. I wasn't quite sure. Because I came from like a school where like, you know, many people would share mine. Like, so they told me, "Oh, this is your microscope." I was like, "Mine? Like, what does that?" And so it was just a whole thing. The lecture hall had like these seatings. But it was very much like today's when I go to my kids' schools in the U.S. I tell you, the those two years, I kind of opened up my minds in terms of like teacher-student ratio of thirty-five to one. We never talked about teacher-student ratio. Exactly. <laughs> I heard it for the first time. It was school. students and students, basically. Students, <laughs> students, and students. Yes. And their timeliness was incredible. If you were a minute late, you got pulled into the principal's room. And so, so, and they came and they made sure, you know, like, you know, all the disciplines of like the best run common school. That was a phenomenal. An inflection point for you going to that school? Yeah, definite inflection point because I think it was way more cosmopolitan. Way more cosmopolitan, more In disciplined, the... more resources. Way more resources. I mean, just no comparison with anything I'd seen before. Like, you know, in the Indian context, I would say college level resources, maybe more. Right. And, you know, they used to organize camps for us. Like, think of the, like, you know, we went for two days on a camp and with all the food, et cetera. You know, maybe we read it in some of our favorite English novels, like People Gone Camping. Right. So uh, it opened up a whole set of things. And also, many of the people in that community were, that school had a much greater dynamic range of social strata, if you will. People like me, plumb in the middle of that fiction. And then people with this, this, uh, the, the kids of like very senior executives at some of the country's top were not known names, like. You know, name your favorite automobile manufacturer of those years and things like that. And so I got to know a lot of them, still, you know, know many of them. So it opened up a whole new world of thinking and kind of brought those people to light in a very human way for me. Yeah. And how did you do academically there? Was I it challenging? So. Fine? Yeah. It was the Acad academics was never in retrospect. As time progressed, maybe I worried a little bit more about making sure I did okay. 
However, fundamentally, it was not a challenge in that sense. Like I was always trying to find more time to read books that I found interesting and go do things with my friends. And so if there was a challenge, it was more like, yeah, your homework to give or kitna karing. Like if book you know, what more deep thing to get in it, etc. That thinking of seeking more depth in academia came more once I went to my uh, undergraduate, you know, the Government College of Engineering in Pune, which is now called COEP Technological University. Uh, it's now deemed university by the state government. It was probably the second oldest, I think, engineering college in India or something like that. There, once, you know, I was not talking with many other folks who, I think, but why did you decide to go to that college? Local. I uh, And what engineering area did you pick? Electrical. Why? Give us the reasoning behind your choice. Because remember, this is for other viewers who are listening. Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you. Sometimes it's, you know, like, you know, today in today's world we ask for explainability in AI systems and then, and that's when you realize Was there data ingested in your decision making frame? There was no data ingested at that time, I presume. That's right. And so once you ask yourself to explain certain things, you start realizing, oh my God, explainability is a hard thing. But and so when I was studying, when I signed up for 11th and 12th, right, I, you had an option in Maharashtra where you could take also this thing called government technical high school. And so, in addition to your main junior college, you could take an additional discipline at this place. And there the choices were, you know, civil, mechanical, electrical, and maybe electronic, something. I don't remember exactly what they called it at the GDHS. And so there, I was not... Maybe I'll rewind and tell you an example of what... Well, Sometime when I was sixth or seventh grade or eighth, I don't know, sometime in the last two, three years at Rasta Bay, I remember reading a book about how metals are conducting and, you know, how mica is a heat conductor, but an electrical insulator and stuff like that. So that was a phase when I was getting fascinated by that at the time. This was not part of school, but just probably a book, somebody like Raju or one of my uncles who's a, who also went to COEP the first person in our house to go to CVP. My name is Sundar. And I live in Hyderabad now. And so when I was playing around with that, you know, we had this camphor box. It was made of iron. And around that time, one of my mamas had given me this small radio handheld with a bulb on the side. I started thinking, hey, this camphor box is made of metal and it's a conductor. Maybe this camphor box can be made into a torch. So I remember like getting together with a friend. I said, hey, can you help me make a hole in this thing? And so we made a hole on one side, somehow inserted that bulb, the metal part of the bulb there, put a little bit of a spring on the other side, put a battery that I had to convince my dad to give me in between, and then put the cover on top. And if you put the battery on top, the light would work. And then... I saw how do I turn this on and off? So I still remember we were making a hole on the lid and putting a cardboard piece in. He cardboard piece insert karo to band ho jayega. And if you pull it out, the lights. And so for like three or four months, this was my toy. I just was fascinated by it. And I think some of those experiences kind of channeled me through. So two separate things. I'll say College of Engineering Pune because of my uncle Sundar. He went there. To me, he was the most technically brilliant person I knew okay. so at that time. And he's still probably up there in terms of people who are just technically phenomenal. His ability to look around at problems and intuit a solution was just phenomenal. Right? It's always been an aspiration for me to like develop that kind of intuition. So he went to COP, so kind of, I was like, okay, so I'm going. Second, I did not feel emotionally ready for hostel life. I was, I have to admit that I had a latent fear of thing. The last thing was, and I, maybe this was me rationalizing it to myself. I said, 
I want to go overseas for graduate study. This is the last four years with family in, in, in a full flight. And my brother is still uh, my best friend. I have to say that in a quiet voice so that my and his wife don't hear it. Right? So, so, but, and it was, you know, four more years with him. And so that was kind of the reason for local. And electrical was just something I have to say appealed to me. So because of that, at government technical high school, I took electrical. And that put me in an advantageous position to get selected in, in for electrical at COEP. And so kind of a cascading sequence. Yeah. So how were those years? Did you enjoy your time? COEP? Oh, absolutely. Even now, i will say magical. You know, why? You, friends, academics? Friends, for most part, friends, the people oh. I met with, many of whom are still we, on your WhatsApp group. Yes, so without <laughs> question, right? <laughs> well, um, we have to keep Meta's earnings going. But anyway, that's a separate that's story. Sure. <laughs> yeah, so, that may be a side effect of, of all of our natural activity. The, uh, yeah, the friends, you know, uh, probably in the Indian context back then, uh, undergraduate college was where you were shaped as an individual. I think that kind of shaping has now kind of shifted earlier in people's lives. Just like the whole world has moved in a way that people are get more precocious, you know, for the time. And But for me, the combination of independence, like even though I didn't want to leave home, I loved the fact that I was kind of on my own now in many ways, the exhilaration of like going around with friends in very unstructured ways, the exhilaration of the fact that, you know, yeah, maybe they take attendance, but they don't really care. Like in school, the regimentation of your thing, and, and I think a lot of my natural tendency toward not liking structure too much found a better home in, in, in college. And, and again, just a whole range of things, but all of my ongoing, you know, deepest friendships are from that era. Yeah. How was the academics? Because that was the foundation for you, right? In a way? Yes. yes. So the academics are fine. Fine. No issue with that? No issue. There were ups and downs because there... The real because you had now freedom, so time management is always, uh, at least initially, a challenge, right? Well, it remained a challenge for me, quite honestly. Yeah. <laughs> for sense. everybody. Because my general... One thing about myself is I have discovered that I can spend far more time than may be profitable or munasib on things that deeply interest me, like interests that you cannot explain. And so uh, I'll tell you, for example, in our final year, I was determined to do final project on robotics. So we built a robotic arm right, from scratch. And I got my uncle Sundar to get me one of his friends who had a fabrication job to donate the fabrication aspect to fabricating the robotic arm. I got the head of our uh, Department of Electrical Engineering, Dr. Doke, to give us stepper motors from a grant he had and stuff like that. So. So what I found is I just completely love the notion of putting something together that is new, talking to a lot of people, both the innovation and this. And then I remember traveling to Bombay to go talk to people who knew robotics to understand how to program these things. How, like, how do I even solve the mathematics? And I learned a lot of new mathematics that I would not have learned as part of my coursework, et cetera. So that was kind of exhilarating in its way. But I'll tell you, the last semester, I was spending so much time on all of this that a lot of my friends got concerned. They said, Prim, you know, now it's may our course may max is hundred. <laughs> so like, you know, and you cannot make up for so the, anyway, thankfully I was able to balance it and uh, did just fine. But that kind of calibration gets harder in that kind of open environment because environment. there isn't a fundamental regulating mechanism that forces you to. That's true. So then what happened then? You were graduating and then your thoughts were to go to the U.S. So tell us, how did you end up here? Prem? I think I decided to go to the U.S. from the time I was in Rastafari. Right. Uh, so 
remember I was telling you about these conversations about this place and say, so I had many conversations with my mom as young, I wanting to go to Rasta, uh, to America. And I still remember like one conversation, a very simple minded conversation in retrospect. I was asking, hey, you said, you know, Russia was first in space and America like on the moon. And I said, what's the difference between these two places? She said, well, like America tends to share its like accomplishments, advances, etc. They're more open about it. They talk about it and Russia keeps them a secret. And I still remember at that time thinking, oh my God, why do they reveal all of this stuff? Like it's going to be, you know, like as a kid, you think the power is in secrecy, but that kind of fascinated me that this is a place that, you know, like simple things somebody tells you leave like long, especially if there's somebody that you have great faith in, they leave a long lasting print on you. So I had this notion of like a open, welcoming thing, which, you know, maybe it has lived up to in some measure, but that kind of was my thing. So even when I was studying, I, I was determined that I was going to come here and explore uh, new boundaries as it were. Okay. So you came, which university did you come to? Tuff, Tufts University. You came in Tufts? Boston. Okay. Yeah. At that point, a lot of it was both, you know, you applied to five or six universities, yeah. you had a range of them. And the one that covered all of your, you got assistantship, assistantship. Audit, all of that yeah. was I equally know. a factor. And, but I had a blast also. This is what I was, it's very interesting. Like at every place I have found someone or the other that has inspired me to go to the next, the next level. Who was at Tufts that inspired and at you? Tufts, it was my advisor, Joseph Noonan. Okay. He passed away two or three years ago, a few years ago. And in fact, me and some of his students, we were at his funeral in Boston. And I actually talk about the connection to Paul. He was, he loved the oceans. He loved sailing. And so he had written a poem about sailing and his love of the water. And so I actually read out that poem at his thing. He had wanted somebody to read it out at his, at his ceremony. Yeah, it was quite, but it was him that constantly, and he was like a breath of fresh air in the sense of saying, like that is theory, right? Like theory doesn't always work. Like you have to focus on what is the problem you're trying to solve? What is the outcome you're trying to achieve? Like, you know, put in that way, it sounds like a very simple minded thing. But to me, it was a new mindset of thinking. Oh, so mathematical purity is not what we are after. It is the change we can deliver through the things that we build that matters. And sometimes the things that we build do not perfectly follow the mathematics that we're trained to exercise. And so that was kind of the big, like the notion of pragmatism in engine that engineering is the art of balancing foundational understanding with pragmatic objectives. He's going less and I would credit very directly to him. Yeah. And he had a very interesting career. Like he had, after his own graduation, he had gone worked at, you know, Raytheon, had done some very solid work in the DOD business, but then went and founded his own company called Bedford Associate that built a software that was actually a competition for uh, MATLAB at the time, in, in the very early days. And so he had, it actually went very well for him for several years. You know, the nature of startups that they go, you know, well, and then suddenly you have to make certain decisions. Then you either end up making a decision that scales the startup for you or that tanks it, I guess. And, and so he decided to, at that point, sell it and, and, and then came to academia and became uh, a professor for the rest of his life. But I think it was that experience, that practical experience of having to make things work, having to deliver things for people that made him that, you know, that, that he channeled into his education. So then you graduated, I guess the issue was about finding a job, Prem. How yeah. did that happen? So those were, you know, a lot of folks might think like, you know, in those days, like the, you know, early to late 90s, you know, if you started your educational journey in the early 90s and, you know, in, and you would graduate second off, this was not a particularly conducive. So there again, I was fortunate. I was, you know, one of the other professors that had connected me with folks in your IBM. So I'd gone and done 
you know, some other search internships here and there. And one of them was at the TJ Watson search center at IBM. And that brought me back to my kind of uh, childhood kind of explorations of language, but in a much more structured way, because I was working on, I started working on handwriting research, writing recognition as in like, you know, transcribing handwritten into text. And I thought this was fascinating that, that you can actually digitize human produced content into something and so into digital form that can be manipulated for other things. So that's what I wanted to do, but I also liked at that time, I'd kind of fallen in love a bit with Boston. I had my friend circle there, etc. So I asked my supervisor at Watson, you know, while I was in getting that internship, that companies like that do this kind of stuff in the Boston area. And so I remember two of them telling me, you know, there's this company called BVM Technologies. It's an MIT spinoff from the late forties. They do the pioneers in speech and language research. They're also pioneers in internet working. In fact, the BBN was the place where the first ARPANET contract was operated, et cetera, packet switching. So, and there was a gentleman there by the name of John McCool, who was the head of the uh, speech and language division. So again, serendipity, one of my classmates had just joined BBN as a software engineer. And so I asked him, Chris, do you know anybody who knows John? Because I'd like to go interview for a role in his team. So anyway, one thing led to another. I got, I got my interview with John and his team. And, you know, as they say, life is as much arithmetic as chemistry. I was giving my talk at BDN on my research. And then my last few slides were about, you know, all of this stuff is good, but there are all these things that I have succeeded in applying my algorithm to statistical signal processing. I said, I have to admit, I don't quite understand, don't quite know how to explain why it's working in these cases, but that's kind of the next set of things I want to look into. So that resonated a lot with John. So, you know, a lot of people can say, I did this, I applied this works. He says, why did you feel comfortable enough saying you don't know? And I told him, you know, I didn't even think about it that much. I told him, this was the curiosity piece of it. Said, this is what I don't know. Maybe if you all have some ideas, I can get it from you and go explore. So it was more from a sense of curiosity. And he said, you know, that's what I'm looking for in, in people that I have that sense of like, not giving me a package story, but saying, here's what I've done. And here's the unknown. And now can we discover new things together? And so strangely enough, the. The part of my presentation I was most insecure about was the one that he <laughs> had a lot of role to play. Uh, so I'd say one takeaway from, from me. What from is that, the takeaway? Yeah. Be, you know, a lot of people say this in a different way, like be yourself or things like that. But I think genuinely follow your inner signal. Because it could have happened that people at BN did resonate to that. But I tell you, I ended up spending almost 20 years there. And the thing was that one, being myself in that interview process and getting selected because of that almost guaranteed a phenomenal cultural match for me, that I would be able to fit in. This is a culture that would work for me and that this is a culture that would welcome me and enable me and help me move forward. And that I have a manager who likes me the way I am, you know, I've long felt one of my other friends once told me, you know, bring the two people in your lives who are most important, who are the most influenced in your happiness. I said, I can think of one, my wife. He said, what's the, well, he said, oh, you know, your manager. So I think that's true. And so being yourself runs the risk of not getting a particular job that you find super important, but it, I think guarantees that you get into a role that you're a great match for, and that is a great match for you. That's a great point. Because let's just say, even if you had not gotten it, it would have still been okay because that would have not been a great match. That's what you're trying to say in some case. Yeah, that's a great point. It, it yeah. was. It, that sense of enlightenment in John, and also instinctively, I said, I can learn from this. And I'll tell you something, uh, Sanjay. John is still so much older than me. 
He's still one of my best friends and my, probably the mentor I trust the most. Just to give you an example, I texted him two days ago and we're going to catch up sometime today, right? So we still talk at least every month. Most of our conversations are, you know, at least an hour or so. And they range a variety of things. And anytime I find myself genuinely at a crossroads saying, I know I can reach out to him and say, John, what's your unbiased? I don't have to say unbiased. John, what is your advice? Like, how would you go around thinking about this? And the greatest mentors are also, like he'll always say, and John, I'd say, John, just learned so much from you over the years. He says, Brun, don't forget, I've learned a lot from you over the years. And I say, John, you know, that makes me feel really great, et cetera, et cetera. But as I've been mentoring people now, et cetera, I find the same, like, Mentoring is somewhat an asymmetric relationship in the sense that over time, early on, the mentee gets more out of the mentorship. But over time, if you have picked the right set of mentees to engage with, you learn way more from them than you do. So many of my, many of the folks I talk with now who ask me for advice, I may not say it as openly as John does because he's a champion, but I secretly think I learn so much by talking with these people. Wow. So just a great point you're making that it's an asymmetrical relationship. Early on, the mentor is more on the giver side, but in many cases, the role can reverse and the mentee becomes more of the giver too, or at least equally. Equally. I'd say, wow. yeah, maybe it equalizes a little bit. Maybe the asymmetry reduces. Yeah. And becomes a more, and that's a much better way of putting it actually. Oh, fantastic yeah. point. Fantastic. So now you put 20 good years there. And what prompted you to move on and how did that happen? So when BDM was kind of this interesting niche in American industry, I later discovered, which is that we did long-term R&D projects funded by DARPA, DOD, other government agencies. So what most product-driven companies thought of as a cost center, for us, that's how we made our livelihood. Right? by driving research advances and then working with uh, other companies and sometimes ourselves to transition those research advances into capabilities that users can use. Right? And one of those areas was speech and language where I think Dar DARPA's contributions in that area have been foundational to all the advances that we've made in speech and language. And so I was fortunate to work in that community at that time. But over time, you know, we first got acquired by kind of a series of uh, changes that happened as in capital society things evolved. We eventually ended up being, you know, going into like a privately held phase where our valuation went up tremendously. And then we were acquired by Raytheon, which is a great company, you know, its own set of great historical contributions and, and current ones to, to the country. But I kind of enjoyed the, the entrepreneurialism and the kind of technical risk-taking of a much smaller enterprise at BBN. And, and so I wanted to channel some of that same thing somewhere. At that time, there were a lot of different opportunities, but the University of Southern California seemed very appealing to me because there's this pretty storied institute called the Information Sciences Institute, which also has come from a DARPA legacy, et cetera. And the opportunity to both be in academia and to lead this kind of historical, it shouldn't just be its third executive director in 40 years, just felt like, you know, what an opportunity for a, a you know, South Indian boy who born in Chennai, grew, grew up in Pune, and he was in the U.S. I thought, how, how can I turn it down? So went there. I still have my affiliation with USC, but after about five years there, I started getting totally drawn into this whole AI revolution that was happening in industry. And so I wanted to go and find out, you know, I had been in industry, but at that time it was not this way. It suddenly felt like it was an inflection point. And I thought I had to go find out what it was about, which is eventually what drew me to Amazon, especially the Alexa thing that I had worked in conversational AI for a long time. Like some of my work at BBN was building the first speech-to-speech -speech translation systems for the U.S. government, you know, English, Arabic, English, Pashto, et cetera, which we had put out in the field. 
And so the fact that this was now like everybody's home, I just, I wanted to go see what is going on. So the next several years were fantastic. I had a blast, everything I was hoping for, learning how to scale, contributing to scaling the technology, essentially leading the, you know, the most substantial AI groups in the world, building connections with academia. I, it was just a magical time for me, several years. Then the whole life I've been in technology, even though I built products, they're from a tech perspective. I said, I'm getting at the point where, you know, American capitalism has so much to offer. I wanted to go learn about like how do verticals work and how, and at the same time, this whole AI inflection, the next inflection point, the generative AI came about and I thought I'd be really interesting to see how to apply all of this to actually change a vertical. So that's what brought me, uh, uh capital one, you know, it's a founder led company. The founder is still essentially driving it, which leads to its own sense of energy, you know, founders bring a different level of energy. And so that, that focus, that passion, the forward being in terms of investing on seminal things. So that's what brought me here. Prem, very briefly for our listeners, you made some critical choices to go to USC, to Amazon, now obviously to Capital One. Looking back in hindsight, they were just fantastic decisions. What was, just briefly, what were the reasonings or any kind of methodology that you use for our listeners? Because in hindsight, they were all just incredibly, the timing was just, your timing was just amazing. And did you pick the timing? What was it? As you said, your gut instinct, what was it? Tell our listeners a little bit, just briefly. I think it's, I, I cannot claim, honestly, to have thought about it in terms of timing, honestly. I think there are two or three things I'll say that I think lead to good decisions in hindsight, right? Two or three attributes. One has to be very aware of, are you 100% happy or not? Like, like in your role. Because I think what happens, what I found out is your happiness quotient can go from like 100 to 95, 90, 85, and slowly, steadily, you forget what 100% happiness was. So somehow being able to maintain a sense of awareness of, am I as happy as I was? Like, okay, if I'm not, what has changed? Why am I not happy? And then looking for things that give you that sense of, that the possibility of that 100% satisfaction, right? And so when I was looking, when I transitioned to USC, I was looking for more of that ability to shape my own research agenda, my technical agenda, where the only people I had to convince were some sponsors to invest in my interests, and then I can do what I want, kind of fundamentally entrepreneurial. And so, and I also felt like, but then I also have always looked at the business aspect of things. So I kind of felt like there was a business model that I could work out uh, in academia by bringing together PhD students and postdocs and research scientists, et cetera, that could provide differentiated value to my sponsors and DARPA and the government. So two things, I'm, so that's one part of things. Like, look at, are you happy? Do you want to improve it? Like, I've been very resistant to, like, remember, I spent like close to 20 years in my first job. It's not like I've been looking to change, but I noticed a sharp sense of something has changed and being willing to talk to it. And this is why having mentors is important. You could be unanchored. You need a mentor who can tell you, look, Frank, I think you're just going through a phase. And that kind of trust to have in a mentor, you better have developed pretty deep relationship with those folks for a while. So that was one thing. The second is when you're going, when you're picking the new place, it should have something more than just what your previous place had so that you can have a sense of novelty. For me, a sense of newness or novelty is important at BDN because I could reinvent what we were doing every few years, that sense of novelty was baked into the business model at the time. And that kind of went away. And so here, see the fact that it was a new context, et cetera. Third thing I've always done is as disruptive as some of these changes look, Sanjay, there are actually threads of deep continuity in them. 
at BBN, I actually collaborated a lot on research with people in many different universities, including at USC. So I always look for other community anchor points that I know I want to work with. And one of the truisms in life is people work with people they like. Right. So people like to work with people they like. Right. And so you want to ask yourself, are there people I like at this place that I'm going to? And that has been the case moving from BBN to USC, from USC to Amazon. I actually went back and worked with a lot of colleagues I'd worked with at BBN. In addition to lots of new friends that I've made, all of those people are now part of my ongoing thread. Now, investments that you make in networking, right? So there are two assets that I think are, they scale on an ongoing basis, almost without limit. The first asset is your education and the investments you make in keeping yourself current in whatever it is that interests you. The second is it takes so much effort to build relationships of trust with people. You have to find a way to keep those relationships going through your professional life, even if they don't give you immediate payback. Right? So I have literally stayed in touch with the people I've loved to work with at every stage in my career, even now. So, Prem, you, you said a lot of things, just to summarize, because those are very critical points. In terms of moving, you said a happiness factor. Second is continuity. Third was the people that you like to work around. That needs to, those would be the three things. And then you said two other points is invest in your education or self-improvement. But And then also networking, or maybe the, these days the networking word is a little bit relationships, but do it over a period of time as you have stayed in touch with a lot of them because there might not be immediate things, but these relationships become very critical going forward. This is for our listeners who I'm trying to unpack an amazing decision-making that you did. Is that a quick, some good summary? Yeah, yeah. I agree with especially the the relationship building and maintenance. Um, there's a little bit of an art there, which is you can't just maintain relationships with people because you decide to do it. So it's also important to figure out who are the people that you enjoy over time. And then once you find you enjoy those people, don't let go of them. It's so hard to find people in life that you truly enjoy. You don't want to let go of those people. And when people ask you, for something, the only question in your mind is, will it help them? And am I capable of doing it? So every time you don't want to make a transaction, right? And so that's in, in my mind, the, the, you have to enjoy that thing of, hey, doing it. And then say, oh, you know, you need this. I know this other person, let me connect the two of you. You guys can do that instinct is a tough one to cultivate. But I think it, in retrospect, I'd say it was something that I kind of enjoyed connecting people. And then I found out that it came back to help me in the most unlikeliest of ways. Like, for example, when I came to USC ISI, I did realize that how many people had nominated me for that role, right? Because in academia, references matter and everything. But I did not even know that there was a set of people in the back end saying, so, and I did not do what I did, expecting that one time somebody will do all of this stuff. So yeah. I think these things matter. These things matter a lot. Prem, coming towards the end of our conversation, I could be going on for hours and maybe we'll have a part two of this because there's so much to uh, learn from you. But uh, we have a lightning round of short uh, questions. So if you can just give us some you know, brief answers. What is your definition of Indianness? The show is called Indianness. Indianness, as you well know, we each have such a part of Indianness is having your own definition of Indianness. I just say that like, you know, the thing. So for me, Indianness is about roots and family to a large extent. Like the fact that culture, religion, family are all intertwined 
because there is no organizing thing. Like you practice everything that you do culturally or spiritually, etc. It's such a very unique way in each family that I just think that the sampradaya notion, the family sampradaya, so that only happens with this family. So that I think is my primary definition. Yes. That's a great answer, family. Prem, one person who has been the most influential in your journey, one. I have a good feeling who it is, but please tell us. One person. Yeah. It might surprise you. I think it's my brother. That's a We've not talked much We've about not talked him. much about him. So it's a but there are lots of people who have been influenced. So I've been fortunate to have a lot of influence in my life. We talked about some of them who had like the big yeah. big influences. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, my brother has been my mentor and advisor for so long that I may not be able to say specifically, he made me do this, but I know every important decision I've made in my life, he's been part of it. Well, that's great. That's great. Prem, Nike's tagline is just do it. If you had your personal tagline, what would that be? Persistence is the highest virtue. Persistence is the highest virtue. I love that. I love that. Great tagline. Last question for you, Prem. If you were talking to Prem, think of Prem as me coming out of undergrad in Pune. Any one or two pieces of advice that you would give him? Well, uh, just recognize how fortunate you've been to get the education and the friendships that you've cultivated in that time. Do much more than this frame who's giving you advice did in nurturing those relationships constantly, not letting go of them, investing in them. Second, I'd say your preparation so far has prepared you to do anything you choose to do. It's a very hard notion to internalize. You always think, okay, but really that education has prepared you to do anything you want to do in your life. So the only limit on what you will do will be your imagination. There is nothing about what you got there that's going to limit you. If anything, it's going to power your future. So just make sure your imagination matches the potential of what you've been given through those four years. Well, that's great advice, Prem. Prem, thank you so much for being so open, so candid with us. As I said, I could go on. We maybe have a part two with you. What an inspirational conversation. I've learned a lot. Thank you for being on the show, Prem. Thank you, uh, Sanjay. I think your style is so warm and kind of enabling that I was finding myself you know, talking about things that I'd long forgotten. So I appreciate it. That's just something magical about the way you engage in these no. conversations. We are honored, Prem. Thank you so much. Thank you.